All right. Uh, thank God for Minister Will White that did our music. Deacon Tony called and said he couldn't make it in. Uh, he was feeling real bad, so so Minister Will did our music for us, and it was a real good choice of songs, so uh, uh, thank God for him. Okay, let's make our confession. Me and the women said, this is my Bible, book of my life. I am who it says I am. I have what it says I have. I can do what it says I can do. Today, I will be taught the indestructible, incorruptible, life-giving, life-changing, mountain-moving, devil-chasing word of God. I boldly confess my mind is alert. My eyes are open. My ears are open. My heart is open to receive the precious seed of the word. I will never be the same. Never, never, never in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, turn to the book of Nahum. We're in the uh, final chapter. There's only three chapters. And right now we're in the final chapter. And we, are, we have maybe about five or six verses left. And we will have concluded our study in the book of Nahum, not to say that we would have brought forth every um, thing that could be taught out of this book, but what God has given us is what we have been passing on to you, and it's been real educational for me because I've been reading the Bible for years, and I have never just taken the time to just study uh, this particular book of Nahum, but as I have studied it, it it's just come alive. And so, so to, to bring us to verse number, actually, I want to, uh, come to verse 14, but to bring us there, let me just kind of see if I can just do a little short cut, cut and show us where we are. Um, God has used the prophet Nahum to prophesy to Nineveh, which is the capital of the Assyrian Empire. And during that time, you know that uh, Nineveh, you know, Assyria that is, was a, it was like a superpower. Uh, it was the bully, you know, in, the, in that particular area, and they were just defeating everybody, and they was real cruel and uh, and people that actually uh, say how you doing was really just being polite because they didn't want to be challenged by them. I'm just using layman terms right there. And so right now judgment uh, is pronounced and we see what judgment actually happened in the city. And so as we look at uh, chapter 3 in these closing verses, it's like Nahum is still giving a message to them actually proud to the judgment even though he has given us some details about what actually happened when uh, the city was invaded and we told you that the side of the the wall where the Tigris River was on uh, somewhere or another the, it evidently had been a, 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 a breach or, or something in the wall a, a flaw and the waters actually uh, pushed that side of the wall out and, and the enemy got in. The Mede and the Babylonians got in and of course you know uh, they conquered uh, that, that particular city. So now when you look at verse 14 I want to go on down 14, and this is what, what he said. He says, draw thee waters for the siege, fortify thy strongholds, go into clay, and tread the mortar, make strong the bricklin. I may not be saying that word right, brick kill. Some of them pronounce it like that, brick kill. But anyway, it seemed like at this point, what is happening is that Nahum is mocking them, really. Because if God says something, I don't care who come against it, you cannot stop what God has said. If God want to get into a particular place, you can't keep him out. All right? And if God want to shut a door, there's nobody can open it. He shut doors that no man can open. He opened doors that no man can close. So, so the prophet Nahum right here is being a little sarcastic. He really just kind of mocking them. So this is what he says to them. He says in that 14th verse, he says, draw these waters for the siege. In other words, fortify thy strongholds, uh, go into the clay and tread the mortar, and make strong the bricklin. In other words, the bricklin was some, something like some kind of little area where a deal where they put um, the bricks in, they, they bake them and they burn. So he was really saying, you know, uh, make preparation because there's a fight coming on and, and the challenger is God. So he says, go ahead on, do whatever you need to do. Make whatever preparation you need to make. And the sad thing about people is that people make a lot of preparations for everything but the things that pertain to God himself. You know, we'll prepare for, you know, uh, family reunions. We'll prepare for certain holidays. But then when it comes to the things of God, people usually are unprepared. And so 
So this is what Nahum is saying. He said, go ahead on, prepare yourself. You know, make sure you got strong walls around you. It kind of reminds me of, of um, the challenge that Elijah gave to the false prophets of the road. You know, he said, okay, you call on your God, and I call on my God. And to show you how polite I am, you go first. And so they called on Baal for a whole half a day, and nothing happened. And so he said, now, my turn. And so you know he had watered down the sacrifice. You know, they made two altars, and so he watered down the sacrifice. And he said, now, now really putting water on the sacrifice, I mean, really, water put out fire. But he was just showing the confidence that I have in the God that I serve is that I can water it down. And see, Elijah was not acting out of his own desire, his own will. The thing that had happened, God had already spoken to him. And so he knew God was going to come through, through for him. And so when he called on God, not only did he consume the sacrifice that was on the altar, but the water, he licked up the water that was also in the trenches. That's how awesome God is. That's the confidence that he had in God. And you know what? We should have that same confidence in God that Elijah had. I heard a sermon many years ago and the guy, he was preaching, he said, where is the God of Elijah? He hadn't gone anywhere. He in the same place he always been. And so, so right here, it appears that this is what Nahum is saying because he had said some real strong things. In other words, maybe you don't believe what I'm saying, so go ahead on. You know, prepare to fight against God. You know, put up your bricks. You know, put up your walls. Uh, fortify your city. And uh, let's see what happens. So he said them to prepare. And a lot of people think that being prepared is to have a lot of money. I'd like to have a lot of money too, but you can have a lot of money and have no appetite. Huh? You can have a lot of money and be the most miserable person on the planet. I, I told you before, I had a, a, a pastor that drove out on the parking lot and his long car was so long, he finally got it in the parking lot. That was before we built this building. And he, he drove up on the parking lot and he told me, he said, you know what? He said, I got a lot of money, but I'm so unhappy. So unhappy. And so there's a lot of things that we can try to do around God and we think that that'll secure us. And I've said it before, the only true security that this world has to offer us is God's security. So finally what God is saying is coming to pass and so this is what, what the prophet Nahum says in verse 14. He's really just saying, you know, prepare yourself. I mean, you know, get ready. Now you watch verse 15. Verse 15 says, there shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee like the canker worm. And the canker worm was that type of, of, of species of worms that, that really atta attack fruit trees. And so uh, all the fruits and stuff, you know, the worms, th those, that's what the canker worms attacked, those trees that were fruit trees. And then you uh, see further on down where you talk about the locusts. The locusts was basically uh, those, that species that attacked everything that's green. You remember in the, in the days of, of uh, the children of Israel down in Egypt, how, you know, the locusts came and they were just eating up, devouring everything that was green. But anyway, you'll see that in just a few minutes about the locusts. But he says in verse 15, there shall a fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. Well, now why is he telling him that this type of judgment is going to happen? And in the 14th verse he say, you know, prepare yourself. Get ready. Because there are a lot of people just don't really believe that, that God, they would never say God is not true to his word, but he is. And if you look back in history, you see how great kingdoms have gone for a certain period of time and all of, all of a sudden they fall. And I don't think they fall because of, you know, the basic economy. I don't think they fall because, you know, um, there's a lack of anything. I think they fall because they turn away from the God of this Bible. That's what happens. I think it's the sin that pulls nations down. And we think about, you know, our nation. We're going through a whole lot right now in our nation. Our nation is going through a whole lot. And I won't um, be happy about saying this, but, but this is what I believe. I believe that our nation is experiencing, is coming close to experiencing what it's like to fall in power. 
And it's because we have become so ungodly. We have put our trust in the horses and the chariots and we have put our trust in the in the governments and in the CDs and the and and the you know the 401ks and our medical plans and our retirement plans and and our businesses and our money and 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 even in our friends we and then then in some people we have put our trust in everything but God himself and nobody trust in God that he will ever let them down never you will never put your trust in God and God don't come through for you he'll come through every time because that's that's just the kind of God he is. So now watch as we move on down. And uh, we, we're, we're going to finish this this evening, I'm almost sure. Now watch in verse 15, he says, Now there shall the fire devour thee. Now you know, they didn't have buildings like we have made out of, you know, metal. You know, they didn't have metal buildings. We have metal in this building. As a matter of fact, the only wood in this building, most of the wood in this building is right here where we're standing. So if you try to set a fire on this building, it, it probably won't burn it because we, it's, it's mostly metal. But in that time, they had a lot of wood. As a matter of fact, the bars and stuff, we talked about, you know, the bars. Um, they, what, if you back up, the, watch verse 13, back up to verse 13. I'm not going backwards, I'm just making a little, I'm just reminiscing just a little bit right here. The latter part of verse 13, you see where it say the fire shall devour the bars. In other words, you, you notice a lot of times in, in those particular uh, uh, kingdoms, whenever they attack, they always set fire. And fire don't burn metal, but fire will certainly burn wood. And so what he's describing to them is the judgment that God is going to bring. Now, now, God's judgment is not coming by the, by the mere hand of God himself, but he's using the Babylonians and the Medes as an instrument of judgment. And sometimes, you know, we see things that happen. We think that it's the devil. Sometimes it's God the one who opened the fence and let the wolf out. Okay? That may not be the best way to describe it. But, but it's not all the time the enemy. Not all the time the devil. God said one time, he says, my hand are not shortened that, that I cannot save. The problem is not me. The problem is you. The problem is not with God. It, it, with the things that's happening in this nation, the problem is our sins. I mean, the more you watch television now, the more it seems like it's just turning me against television. We all like entertainment, but it's hard to find clean entertainment because everything now seems like it's trying to say that we, sh we know what God say, but this is what we say. And so the media a lot of times try to put in, my, in your mind because after a while you see a thing for a certain period of time you know, you get used to it. I remember there was a time when if a person had, uh, we, we call it the Irish League, you know, had to have cut down real low. We thought that was, man, wow, man. Uh, even if a person was bald, we thought that, oh, man, ooh, no, I would not I would never want to do it. But the more you see people with that type of hairstyle, the more you see people shave their heads, the more common it becomes. And it's with just about anything else. You see it over a period of time, and all of a sudden, it become common. And it's no longer really something that people just scorn at. There's no lo longer something. See, it's a problem when you can look at homosexuality, when you can look at, you know, um, all, all these sex, you're seeing sex trafficking and all that, and abortion, and, and you just say, oh, well, it's just, just human choices. Yeah, but it's the wrong choice, and it ought to have something, uh, some kind of effect upon us. I believe when the words say, be ye angry and sin not, I believe that some of these things that we see in our nation ought to be a category of things that ought to make us angry, even though our anger shouldn't lead us to go burn down in a, a bomb and abortion clinic, but ought to, it ought to vex our spirit. When, when Solomon, not Solomon, but when Noah, uh, not Noah, uh, when, when Lot was down in Sodom and Gomorrah, he, his spirit was vexed. Even though he was backslid, his spirit was vexed because he was among all that ungodly, immoral lifestyle, homosexuality, and all of that. But it seemed like we just, you know, it just seemed like the church has no conviction about it. Because if we did, we'll preach it. 
You know, every message can't be to tickle your ears and to make you feel good. Some of it needs to come right down the middle and say, hey, this is where we're going wrong. God is not pleased at the way that we are living in our nation, okay? And I know we have new administration. I don't even want to get into that part of it. Uh, I'm going to respect the office, but I'm not going to agree with anybody that make any laws that contradict what the Word of God says. I'm not, I'm just, I just cannot. I cannot uh, preach the truth of God's Word and at the same time agree with abortion, uh, um, same-sex marriages. I can't do that. And, uh, and I know it's best for anybody that's going to say something, say it now, because the, the, the further we get into um, this administration, the less you're going to hear people say anything about same-sex marriages and all this other stuff because nobody want to be sued, nobody want to be criticized, and everybody want people to respond and say, amen, I agree with you. You cannot speak the word of God and expect everybody to agree with you. You may have been able to do it in the 1800s, but you can't do it here in the 21st century because there are some wild ideals about life and about people uh, that I've never seen before where people where you want to say a little child can choose whether it want to be male or female and call that, you know, human rights. I call that insanity. That's what I call that. I call that, I call that a parent or somebody who really, you know, they need the raw put on them. Your children actually are subject to what you say. You know, they, they have no rights, to be honest. They only have the right, rights you give them. And they have the rights to remain silent and anything that they say can be used against them in your, in your, where your, wherever your woodshed is. But we have reversed everything, and you can see how the spirit of iniquity is running rampant across the world and especially in our nation. Okay, now watch this here. I'm, and I'm not, I'm not making this political. I'm just trying to say what it is. Now watch this. You look at verse number 15, and I'm moving on down. So he says, there shall the fire devour thee. And even though you got your bars and stuff up, fire will burn. If it get hot enough, I'm going to tell you something, it'll burn. So it says, the fire shall devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. I mean, that's, that's, that's war right there. That's, that's, that's reaping what you've sown. What you have done to others now is going to come back to you. That's why when you, when you sow words, be careful the words you sow because it's just like a boomerang. It'll come right back to you. You talk about somebody, I guarantee you, somebody probably going to end up talking about you. So you have to watch the words you say. Now, now watch this here. I'm, I'm moving on, and, and I know you think that we're not going to make it because, um, you know, we're taking all this time to say what we already said. We're going to make it. In verse 15, it says, There shall the fire devour thee, the sword shall cut thee off, it shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Now, what does he describe? He's describing that you're not going to be no challenge. Just like the canker worm eat all those fruit. And the worst thing to do is to bite down on the apple and, and he up in there. He, he up in there. He, he was up in there from the very start. And so actually as it bloomed out, he was already there. He didn't dig his way in. As a matter of fact, if you, if you see a hole in the apple, don't worry. The, 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 the worm, he, he ate his way out. But if there's no hole in the apple, that little soft spot in there was somewhere in the blossom, that, that part, he was already there. And so the canker worm is going to destroy the fruit life. And those people, they, they lived a lot on fruit. Uh, I'm not saying they were all vegetarians but they were more vegetarian than we are, okay? But now watch this here, it, and just think about now, uh, no onions, no apples, no peach, no banana. What is it like eating just hamburger meat and bread? You say, well, I get my name, well, you get your pickles, you know, sandwich bread. I mean, just think about it. See, God, shows in more ways than one that he's in control. And so he don't just come in and, and just knock you out. He leave evidence, fingerprints, that you don't have to get no FBI. I'm the one that did this. 
Okay, now watch this. So he says in verse number, number uh, well, let me just finish. I want to finish this uh, 15th verse. We'll read it all the way through. So he says, there shall the fire devour thee. The sword shall cut thee off. It shall eat thee up like the canker worm. Watch this here now. Make thyself like the locust. Now, now listen to what he said. He said, go, go, but go ahead on, make yourself. And you know, locusts, they come in the millions. And they devour everything in their path. Even in the, in the tribulation period, there's a locust-like type demons. Uh, the demons, that's what they really are. They're going to come forth and they're going to devour, but they're not going to be able to, uh, they're going to be commanded not touching the green thing. Okay? So, but anyway, if you look in the history of Israel, you can see how the locusts are very dangerous. You remember the word say that uh, God said in one place, he said that he would restore to your yields that the locusts ate because they, they eat. They'll eat anything that's green like leaves and, 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 and um, you know, uh, buds. So, so he says, go ahead on, be like the locusts. Get your military strength together. You know, get your crowd, get, get your numbers together. Now watch this. Look at the latter part of verse 15. He says, make thyself many like the canker worm. No, that ain't what, yeah, okay, yeah. Make thyself many like the canker worm. In the first part of that, he's saying that they're going to be eaten up like the canker worm. But in the latter part, he says, make thyself like the canker worm. Make thyself like the locusts. In other words, increase your numbers. You know, give, give them all the training they need to get ready because they're going to battle against God. But God's battle is going to be used in a sense by him sending in the Medes and the Babylonians. So verse 16 says, Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spoiled and fly it away. Now the reason why they had so much prosperity because they were taken from everybody else. They conquered pretty much everybody around them. The Assyrian, I mean you check out history and you can see that the Assyrian Empire was a superpower in that day and time. And I told you before, and it bears repeating, they, they would invade certain cities. When they heard, the certain cities heard that they were getting ready to be invaded by the Assyrians, they would commit suicide. Now, for, for a whole city to commit suicide, it had to be very dreadful for them to, you know, want to face this enemy because they didn't just kill them. You remember Saul? You remember Saul when, you know, on Mount uh, uh, Gib Gibeo, Gib Gibeo, where he was uh, put to death, him and, him and Jonathan? He told one of his armor bearers, he said, he say, you know, go ahead and, and just kill me in so many words because... If the Philistines, if they get hold of me, they're going to misuse me and abuse me. So let me just go on die easy. Whether, you know, it's an easy way to die, but make it easy for me. And he wouldn't do it. But anyway, he fell on his sword and, um, and he, he died because he didn't want to fall in the hand of the enemy. But that's the way a Syrian empire, that's the way they felt when people knew that they were being raided by the Assyrians. They knew it's time to, hey, you can't dig a hole, you can't, you know, get out of Dodge or whatever. They were just that dreadful. Okay, now, now watch this here in verse number 16. Again, 16. It says, Thou hast multiplied thy merchants above the stars of heaven. The canker worm spotted and flied away. That's what it's going to appear like. It's going to appear like everything you had, it was lost in a day. You know, Babylon is going to be re rebuilt, and at some point in time, it's going to become the financial empire of the world. But in one hour, all that wealth is going to go down to zero. In one hour. You can have so much, I know people say, man, what a, what a, a difference a day can make. Well, sometimes it's what an hour can make. It don't take all day in some cases. But anyway, this is, uh, uh, this is what's happening with the, with the Ninevites. 
Now watch in verse number 17, it says, the crowned, actually that's talking about the princes, are like locusts, and our captains like the great grasshoppers, which camp in the hedges in the cold day. But when the sun arises, in other words, that's when the heat come on, they flee away. And their place is not known where they are. In other words, he says, now, I told you everything you need to do to prepare yourself for the battle. But then when it really come down to the wire, when it really come down to where the rubber meets the road, that's the way we said, you know, in Louisiana, when the rubber meets the road, your captains and your leaders and all of them, they're going to do just like the grasshoppers. And, you know, they, they hide and everything. And I don't know if you call it, you know, hibernation or what, but as soon as the heat comes on, they disappear. And you remember in the, in the, um, in the second chapter, and I don't want to just go back and read all that, but in the second chapter, uh, he started, it was like the captain was telling them to stand, stand. In verse 8, chapter 2, but none looked back. In other words, captain, I don't care what you say, I'm out of here. See, a lot of people really, you know, really tough as long as they're in a crowd. And that's why I think the modern, the modern day of street fighting is games. When I was coming up, what we used to do, it used to be one-on-one. -on -one. And, and, and the way we used to do it was that everybody got in a circle, and you got in the middle of the circle, and it was just you and that individual. If he whipped you, you got whipped. If he whipped you or you whipped him, he just got whipped. And that was the end of it. But see, now it's all gang banging. As long as I got my partners with me, then, you know, I'm not afraid. But what about when your partners flee? And now you're standing by yourself. You ain't as bad as we thought. You were doing all that talk because you know you had boo boo, shoo shoo. Ray Ray, and you had all of them over there. And, and I remember one, one time, and, and this is the truth here, I, I, I don't want to expose too much of what happened in the history of Benton, but I remember that there's one guy in Benton, they used to put him up to start the fights. And once the fight got started, the rest of them jumped in. But that was rare, that was rare. But normally, it was a one-on-one. -on -one. And so what it appears now that the Ninevites, who seem to be so strong and so mighty, all of a sudden now they're being invaded, and they're not, as, they're not as tough as they seem to be. See, a lot of people are real tough, as long as they got a 45. But they're not as tough when all of a sudden now they've been incarcerated and in the same cell with the person that they had a conflict with. See, some people think they're really, really, really heavy as long as they, they, they're carrying heavy cash. They talk different. But when all the cash is gone, they become a different person. And so this is basically the language that he's saying right here. Now, if you look at verse number seven, 17 again, now watch this. He say the, the crown of the princes are like the locusts and our captains like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges of the cold, in the cold day. But when the sun arises, they flee away, and their place is not known where they are. In other words, he said that you're going to be just like them. And you can see it in chapter 2 where the captain was saying, stand, stand. In other words, he was saying, fight. But what they saw coming at them appeared to be greater than who they were, and they began to flee and not even look back. All right? See, anybody is strong when they feel like they got enough backup. Yeah, anybody is strong when they feel like they got enough backup, they tough. You got 15 guys behind you, you say, hey, come on, bring it on. And you do that for about 15 minutes, bring it on, bring it on. And finally they begin to come, and you look back, calling on your guys, and they're all gone. So you're not as tough now. See, a lot of people have talk, 
and that's it. I think even when it comes to the child of God, I think that whatever we say, we ought to be able to back it up with what we do. If we say we love Jesus, back it up by loving a person that gives you the most problems. You don't really test your love for Jesus by your love for Jesus. You test your love for Jesus and your love for God by your love toward your brother, your sister, or your enemy. You want me to tell you how close you are to the Lord? As close as you are to the person that agitates you the most. How close you are to them. Well, you say, I can't stand them. Okay. Are you, are you saved? I, I understand you may not have a, um, a working relationship together, but, but is it hatred or, or you just call it strong dislike? You know, it's one or the other. Which one is it? You say strong dislike? Well, that's the same as hatred. It's the same thing. That's, what's a trick question? But you test your love for God because he don't need no water. He don't need a ride. He, he don't need a loan. He don't need you to forgive him. He ain't done nothing wrong. So the test of how really strong you are is how you deal with your neighbor, how you deal with your family, how you deal with one another. That's a test right there. Because some people make it difficult for you to love. Did you know that? But then, is there any time or is there ever a time when God say, okay, you have permission not to love this week? Uh, you, you got permission to hate that one. Never. Never. And you can even see the love of God even in his judgment uh, toward the people. He really didn't want to judge them. Look at the long suffering. Look at how long over between 100 and 150 years before he actually brought judgment on them. Now think about this. You know, these people are dealing with this wicked, powerful empire for all this time. And it appears that, you know, God is not moving on it. You know, that shows some long suffering and some love that God really is just, he's just a good God. He's not looking for you to mess up so he can, can hit you over the head. He, he's not waiting on you to mess up. No, no, no. He's long suffering. He's a God of however many chances you need. Okay, now watch this here. And I'm getting ready to come down. Probably, probably ain't going to be much longer now. We're almost there. I'm, I'm pretty sure. I'm almost really a real 100% now sure that we're going to close out uh, this book uh, today. I hope it don't say it in your heart. Okay, now watch one more time. I'm going to read this one more time and see if you don't get it right now. Because just reading through it, it it's, it's, you'll miss it. So it says, the princess, I'm going to use princess right there because that's who he's talking about when he say the crown. The princess was the one that wore the crowns. He says, thy princes are like the locusts and thy captains like the great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges of the, in the cold day. But when the sun arises, they flee away and their place is not known where they are. In other words, they run so far until now you can't see them, you don't know where they are because now the heat is on. See, a lot of people, they, they find, you know, as long as the heat not put on. You know, we got a lot of Christians say, no, I don't cuss, I don't, I don't cuss no more. Only time I cuss is when I get hot. Yeah, well, well, should you cuss then? You know, that, that should never be a time that you let the heat bring out of you. I mean, you're not a serpent. I can understand Paul picking up the sticks and, and, and the fire brought that snake out, but you're not a snake. But sometimes when heat is put on a lot of us, you know, we, we do the wrong thing. I can see Peter. Peter said, you know, Jesus, you, 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 you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. And uh, that's who you are. Jesus said, mm, Simon, Peter, mm. he said, blessed are Simon of Jonah for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto thee, but my father which is in heaven. He said, and thou art Peter, and upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then uh, Jesus said, well, you know, no longer preach the gospel of the kingdom, 
because I'm going to Jerusalem. And Peter says, no, no, don't, don't do that, Jesus, no. No, we, we still need fish and bread. No, don't, don't do that. And then in another place, Jesus says that, uh, you know, I'm going to be betrayed this night. And, and um, says that um, some of you are going you gonna to deny me and you're going to run away. Peter said, oh, no, not me. He said, they might, but not me. He said, I'll die with you. Wherever you go, Jesus, I'm going. I, I'm going to do whatever you say. I'm, I'm with you. But what no heat put on him until he saw Jesus apprehended. And now he's falling from afar. And now he's questioned about, hey, when you with the man, Jesus already told him that, you know, a rooster going to preach a sermon. And, and when he get through preaching the sermon, then you're going to know um, that what I told you about you denied me, that it's going to come true. So when the heat was put on him, he, he denied. See, the test of who you are is when the heat is put on you. The heat brings out of you what's in you. And so right now, the heat being put on the Assyrians, it just brings out of them in the first place, yeah, they wicked and they were evil, but they were not as courageous as it appeared. Because if that was the case, why not go ahead on and fight the battle? Why run off? Why, why fly away? Why come out of your hedges and have to go and you fought everybody else? It's because they had the upper hand. All right? See, there are some nations that some countries will pick on because they know they don't have very much might. But nations that seem like their brick is just as big as your brick, you don't want to deal with them because you feel like if I throw my brick and miss you, you still got a brick. And so, so when the heat is on, it determines who you really are. I mean, you, you, if you're saved, you're saved. I'm not trying to doubt you, make you doubt your salvation, but I'm just talking about you know, character especially. You know, if you have that kind of character, he to bring, if cussing in you, he to, he to bring it out. Yeah. Now, cussing is in me too. But I've come to a place to realize who I am in Christ and therefore the heat don't bring it out. I refuse to let it out because I'm in control of my tongue. You know, you can't tell me what to say. I mean, I can say what you tell me to say, but I'm the one that's in control of releasing that out of my mouth. So, so, so right here, if I had confidence in them as warriors, at this point I lose my confidence because you're running your chicken. You're not, you're not, you're not soaring like an eagle now. You, you, you're flopping like a buzzard. Okay, now watch this. And then he goes on in verse number 18. And I could really just go on and preach a sermon on this one, but I, I'm not going to do that. So he says, thy shepherds. I mean, now, now watch this. You see how this great empire at one point seemed to be the superpower in that area, how all of a sudden this kingdom is coming down. Kingdom do fall. Kingdom do fall. I, I pray for America. My prayer uh, to God for America, as a matter of fact, as I was in prayer yesterday, and I'm usually in prayer pretty much throughout the day. I don't just pray in the morning, you know, I pray in the morning, but I try to just pray throughout the day. I just act like God is walking beside me, and I say, Lord, that was, wasn't that great? You know, that's where I talk. You know, somebody say, you, that's crazy, you talking to yourself. No, I ain't talking to myself. I'm talking to God, and uh, that's, that's the way I, I go. But, but anyway, um, oh, I lost my thought. I forgot what I was going to say. Somebody must have looked at me the wrong way or something. Uh, anybody know what you got? Are there any prophets in the house? <laughs> okay. Well, let me just move on anyway, because I, I, it'll probably come back to me. But anyway, uh, let, let me just go ahead on and close this out. Okay. Say that again. I, I, you know what? With that mask on, I couldn't hardly make out what you were saying, so I'm going to just move on. Yeah. And I, and I know with that mask on, I appreciate you all wearing your mask and everything. Um, Someday we'll be able to, you know, be able to take it off. And if you're not sitting around somebody, I don't have a problem with you. You know, you're okay. But, um, but anyway, let me, just, let me just move on. I thought that was a real good point, too, but whatever it was. 
Man, there's something. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay, but I'm, I'm coming back to it. Now watch verse 18. It says, uh, thy shepherds slumber. O king of Assyria, thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people are scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. Man, this sounds so much like our churches today. Shepherds slumber. That means leadership is gone. I want you to turn to the book of Jeremiah right quick if you do that. Jeremiah chapter 10. Watch this right quick. I, I just couldn't resist this verse of scripture here. Jeremiah chapter 10. Watch this. The word says, I'm looking at verse 19. 10, 19. I want to start at verse 19. It says, woe is me for my hurt. My wound is grievous. But I said, truly, this is a grief, and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cars broken, my children are gone forth from me, and they are not. There is none that stretches forth my tent anymore, and to set up my curtains. Now watch this here. For the, watch this, for the pastors, that's the same as shepherds. I'll become, well, this is not going to be a good word right here, but let me just go on and say it. They have become what the scripture calls right here now. I, I, now I'm not calling anybody stupid, but brutish is the word. Brutish means stupid. Now, it says, for thy shepherds uh, become stupid. And have not sought the Lord. Trying to preach and they never prayed about nothing. Making decisions that affect people's lives and they hadn't talked to God about nothing. My, my custom is that I always talk to God about you before I come and talk to you about God. But let me see if I can put it in a nutshell because I have just a few minutes left and I, want, I, I am going to conclude this. And I want to conclude it on a good note. Um, if, it's, if it's possible. But most of you have, have dogs around your house. Okay, now I just wanted to read that about the stupid shepherds. They become stupid, brutish. That, that means stupid. Nah. Stupid is not the same as ignorant. Ignorant is that you just don't know. In other words, you got a Bible and you read it, but you, you don't understand it. Stupid is you got one, you don't even read it. You use it as a piece of furniture. Stupid is brutish. But let me see if I can give you a better definition of it. Most of you that have dogs around your house, you know, if you have them inside your house, then when, when somebody come to your door, ring a doorbell or whatever, the dog ought to bark. That don't mean they're going to bite. I mean, it's just the nature of a dog to bark. Somebody ring the doorbell, roof, roof. He should bark. That lets you know that, hey, somebody is coming. And then there are some houses that may not have doorbells. And there are some dogs' sensitivity is so great. I went to a house. Um, a guy told me that I could come and fish on his, on his lake. And so I went to his house and let him know what kind of truck I was going to be driving. And by the time I got to the door, and uh, I just, did, I, don't, I didn't know if I ring the doorbell or if I, I think I tapped the door just a little bit. And it sounded like about 15 dogs that was in there, they just started barking. And when the lady came to the door, I, I stood back, I made very sure. I tell you what, I put it like this, there's no way I would have broken that house with all those barking dogs in there. But see, it's stupid. When the dogs don't bark. And some pastors have become like that. I ain't called nobody's name. That see trouble but won't bark. That won't warn the people. That for favor and the good graces of the people won't share concerning certain things that relate to people's lives. 
a shepherd looks out for the sheep. He's not just looking out for what's going on in his pocketbook. He's out for the sheep. But in this case, he says the shepherds slumber. In other words, they're out of it. They're between being asleep and awake. They're somewhere in between. They're not conscious enough to give you proper leadership. And I'm going to tell you something. When leadership begins to go, then fellowship usually go in the same direction. Okay, so he says right here, he says, thy shepherds, I'm back in, I'm back in the book of Nahum, and I'm, I'm getting ready to close it out. I, I am, and it's probably going to be two or three minutes, and I'm, I'm done with this. But, but watch this here. He says, the shepherds slumber. O king of Assyria, thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. Thy people are scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. Well, that don't sound like a shepherd. Because the shepherd is concerned about the sheep. As a matter of fact, when one goes astray, you know, he leaves the 99 and he goes after the one. Now, in our day and time, we have technology, so we make telephone calls. We try to do whatever we can to reach out to people. And then sometimes people don't want to reach, you reach out to them, and they do that by not answering the phone. I've called several people, and, and when I realize that because everybody you keep your phone with you just like you have your hands and so if I dial your number and you don't answer the phone I know it's because either you're busy or you see my number and you just don't want to talk you're not going to leave your phone if you leave it one time you're not going to leave it three or four times and so if I call three or four times and, and there's no response then I just move to the next person or either I just it's just my interpretation that they don't want to be bothered because at some point you're going to see my number and you're going to return the call. But if you know it's the pastor, then you really don't want to talk to the pastor. That's the reason why the, the kids that, that I have, most of all the kids, numbers who, who graduated, I have their numbers saved in my high-tech tech, technological phone. I have, yeah, I have those numbers saved in there and I call them and most of the time they'll answer and I'll talk to them about one to two minutes in the end of the conversation. But some of the stray sheep, I'll call and I'll let it go until the voicemail come on. And that way I know when they pick up the phone, they see, oh, pastor done call. Okay, I know what he want. You don't know what I want because I hadn't told you. I hadn't talked to you. You understand? Sometimes I'm just calling because I hadn't seen you in a while. And I just, you know, wanted to know. I'm not, if you go to another church, I don't have no problem with that. But I just want to make sure that you okay. You know what I mean? That's where I do it. And I, and, and I have a lot of people in the body that help me do that because, you know, I'm one person. And sometimes I may overlook a person and not really just think about it. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm human too. But normally when the Lord puts somebody on my heart, I, I try to get in touch with them. But you got shepherds today. All they want is your pocketbook. They don't care if you live or die. Huh? If, if, if you own life support, all they want to know is that did you make out a wheel to the church? Huh? Th these are shepherds who are dumb, who don't give people the word of God. These are dumb shepherds. They may have a PhD, but it's a dumb shepherd. And so he says in verse 18, he says the leadership is gone. And it goes, it starts to me. I believe it starts in the church house and it goes all the way to our nation's capital. Wherever that nation is, wherever that capital is, I believe it starts right here and it goes right there. You remember when Nineveh first embraced the word of God through the preaching of Jonah? It was the leaders as well. It started with, as a matter of fact, it was the leader that actually the king of Nineveh, the, the, the leader in that day, it was him that actually decided we're going we gonna, to we gonna call a, uh, a fast and we're going to dress in sackcloth and ashes. And so I believe there needs to be a separation. I don't believe that the state needs to come and tell me what to preach and what I cannot preach, but I, need, I think there needs to be some kind of connection. You understand that? I think we can be connected and still not be, you know, um, that much into the political world. But anyway, the shepherds 
slumber, O king of Assyria. Thy nobles shall dwell in the dust. The people are scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them because they're running everywhere. They're scattered. That's what persecution would do, scatter. And it appears that even this pandemic has scattered a lot of people from a lot of congregations. And what I'm waiting to see, and I prayed about it, I'm waiting to see how many people are going to return back to their foes once they say, once they say that it's safe. I say it's already safe. Do what you need to do. You're going everywhere else. Do what you need to do. You'll be okay. And then if you get it, you can get rid of it. You know, uh, there are people who have done everything that is possible and safe uh, to keep them safe and still have gotten a virus. And if they don't get the virus, they've gotten flu. They've gotten hemorrhoids. They've gotten something. But God can heal it all. And even though God can heal it all, sometimes people make transition. We ain't going to stop that. This is a fallen world. Okay? But leadership is very important. And in this particular time, leadership is gone. So it is, I think, with a lot of our congregations. Now, now the final verse goes right here. It says, there's no healing of thy bruise. Watch this here now. now. Now, while he's saying this, it hadn't happened. But as we read it, it has happened. See, when he said it, it was like prophecy. But now that it has happened, it has become history. And so this is what he says in, my, in the final verse here. He said, there's no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear. Oh boy, now watch this here. All that hear report of you. That's the proper word. All that hear report of you, of thee, shall clap the hands over thee. For upon whom has thou not, uh, whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually? In other words, he says, when it's all said and done, when you have reaped what you have sown, all the surrounding nations will be clapping their hands because you've been a bully. You know, it's sad to say, but I believe that to a certain degree that America has been exposed, and I believe around the world, there are a lot of people that are clapping their hands because of turmoil that we're having in America. But now, I, I want to close on this, this note right here in verse 19. He says, now there's no healing for thy bruise. In other words, they got what they deserved. They got what they deserved. But now check this out. They got what they deserved. That was justice. God would have forgiven them if they had repented. So because they didn't, they got what they deserved. But now watch this here. I'm closing out right here. And this, this book closed with a question mark. Two books closed with a question mark. Book of Jonah and the book of Nahum. Jesus got what we deserved. What we deserve, God put it on Jesus. He didn't deserve the stripes on his body. He did not deserve crucifixion. Jesus did not deserve the treatment that he got even prior to the nails going in his hand and the spear going in his side and the thorns going on his head. He did not deserve it, but he got what we deserved. And he got what we deserved so that in his resurrection that would declare God's total satisfaction that you and I could have deliverance, that we could have salvation. It's all because of his goodness. It's not because of our goodness. We were not that good. We may not have been bad as the next person, but we were really not that good. But it was the goodness of God through his son, Jesus Christ, that allowed him to go to the cross. Minister Brown already talked about it, but you can't say too much about it because it never changed. It's the same message. He went to the cross, and on the cross he became sin for you and I. Shed every drop. I believe there was not one ounce of blood remaining in his body. He shed every drop of his blood for the price of our redemption. Raised from the dead, carried that blood to heaven, sprinkled it on the, 
the, the mercy seat in heaven and turn the throne of judgment into a throne of grace and now you and I can find grace to help in time of trouble. So, so as we conclude our study in the book of Nahum, it's, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's been a small book. It took us a little time to get through here, but, but there are some lessons in this book for a lifetime. And I think that it would, it would do good if we take heed to the things that we've heard and, uh, and pray for our nation because just like God judged, uh, judged Nineveh, the Assyrian Empire, just like he judged uh, Babylon, just like he judged um, Egypt, just like he judged Medo Persia, just like he judged Rome, and just like he judged other nations around the world, uh, God has his eyes on America. But my prayer, and this is what I was going to say earlier that I forgot, but it came back. But my prayer, as I pray for America, I pray God, I say, you know, we have a lot of Christians in this country. I say, we know that our, our country is not right. But I say for the sake of the saved people, those people that are really calling out to you, those, those people that really love you and are praying for you, I say, God, Will you judge the righteous with the unrighteous? This is my prayer to God. I'm just telling you what I pray. Say, will you judge the righteous with the wicked? I say, God, have mercy on America. And that's what I want to end this book, you know, with my request from you, is to ask you to pray the same prayer in agreement with me, that God would have mercy on America. Because you may not see what I see, and I only want to tell you what I see. I don't want to even end like that. But, but our country needs prayer, and uh, I believe that if we pray, then God will hear our prayer, and I believe that God will have mercy. I believe mercy can still be found for, for America. I do believe it. Judgment is coming. It's, it's coming. But I believe that God can, like he spared the days, in the days before the flood, God allowed he allowed Noah and his family to get in the ark before the judgment came. It was sort of like a picture of the rapture. I believe that God allowed us to get caught out of here before the full judgment is poured out on this nation. Not only on this nation, on the world, because the whole world is turning in the same direction. But, but Jesus Christ is still there and available for anybody to call upon him. His salvation is worldwide. That's the reason why he was crucified outside the gate. It's not a gated salvation. It's ungated. It's unwalled. And anybody can have it if they have the faith to believe. But we have to have the want to the share. So keep that in your mind. I ask you to, to let that be your prayer in agreement for me. And I believe that God will hear our prayer. All right? Will you stand? And so we conclude our study in the book of Nahum. I trust it's been a blessing to you. It was the first time I've ever taught from the book, but I, I did the best I, I could. I studied, and I, 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 I came to you with what, what I believe that God showed me, and I hope that it add to your knowledge of God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this entire series. I don't know how long it was. I know when it got started, but however long it was, we, we come to the end of our study here, and I'm trusting you for the next uh, study, and I just pray, oh God, that your word will bring forth the necessary fruit, encourage and build up every person that has been through this entire study. And, um, and I pray that Jesus Christ was magnified and will be magnified in everything that we teach in his birth, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. We want to see Jesus. And God, we give you the praise. We give you the glory. We thank you for this journey. It's been a great journey. And I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord as you remain standing. I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Nelson Chris if you come extend the invitation. <laughs>